I am Mahanur Yusuf, and I graduated from Harvard Business School in 2016 with a PLBA. I'm also co-chairing Harvard in Tech Seattle chapter. Harvard in Tech is the official Harvard University-wide alumni group for technology. We hope to further the development of technology through encouraging innovation, providing resources and networks, and promoting technological activity throughout the Harvard community. Today's webinar is getting recorded and will be shared at the Harvard in Tech Seattle webpage. I'm here with Roger Hackett, my fellow alum, to moderate a panel discussion about racism, why we must solve it in technology. I'm Roger Hackett, HES 2018. I am the president of Ryan and Robbie LLC, where we develop children's books for bilinguals and smart play systems. We are so honored to have five distinguished panelists joining us today. Angela Anthony, a fellow Harvard alum, is the founder and CEO of Scoutable, a next generation platform for hiring. Scoutable's science-backed video games identify a person's unique cognitive and personality strengths from gameplay and uncovers opportunities where a candidate's strengths match those of top performers. Scoutable's technology combats systemic bias by shifting the focus away from traditionally biased resume screens and instead captures each candidate's most job relevant abilities on a level playing field. Angela spent nine years at Harvard focusing her psychology, business and law degrees on labor market issues across society. After Harvard, she worked at the White House under the Obama administration as part of the National Economic Council. During this time, she was writing a book about her Harvard research titled Invisible Handcuffs, which ultimately became the primary research underlying Scoutable. Scoutable was recently named one of Inc. Magazine's eight most innovative startups of the year, and Angela was named to Inc.'s female uh, founders' 100 list. Angela is joining us from San Francisco. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Stacy Kirk is the founder and CEO of Quality Works Consulting Group, a global leader in software quality innovation and delivery. She leads a team of brilliant technologists and innovators representing diverse backgrounds, including over 46% women of color. Their latest product, Posture, helps enterprises drive compliance regardless of their level of in-house knowledge. An AI-powered platform simplifies the process of gaining and maintaining a cybersecurity compliance program. She holds a degree in computer science from Stanford University. As an African-American woman in technology, she is a leader and promoter of diversity and inclusion. Stacy's passion is advancing STEM education and empowering the next generation of women leaders in technology. Her passion for diversity in STEM led her to be a first Lego League robotics coach, as well as an advisor and sponsor of youth-focused STEM nonprofit organizations. Stacy is joining us from LA. Everyone. Thank you. Next, Kevin Nichols is the founder, president, and CEO of an Oakland-based Google and Microsoft-funded social impact venture with Stanford University called the Social Engineering Project Inc. that is designed to address the lack of diversity in the tech industry. Kevin consults with various tech companies on creating an inclusive culture work environment recruitment and retention, utilizing data-driven analytics and developing and implementing diversity councils and employees. Kevin is an expert in three distinct areas, legal, diversity, and social networking for over 22 years. He is the founder of two professional networking LinkedIn groups in the Bay Area and over 8,000 members combined. Kevin is a proud member of Kappa Alpha C Fraternity Inc. Kevin's social networking capabilities have been featured on LinkedIn's Hall of Fame, CNN Money, 
Reuters, uh, Market Watch, and the Wall Street Journal. Kevin attended the University of California, Berkeley, completed an executive program for social entrepreneurship at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, and recently graduated from the Fundraising Academy through uh, JFK University's Stanford Institute of Philanthropy. Kevin is joining us from San Francisco. Welcome. Thank you, Kevin. John Scott, a fellow Harvard alum, is the Vice President and Risk Management Manager at Bank of the West, BNP Paribas Group, where he leads a team of analysts working on credit loss models to show the Federal Reserve and FDIC that bank has enough capital to survive several stressed economic environments. Prior to Bank of the West, uh, John was principal of economic and product analysis at Pacific Gas and Electric Company, where he evaluated investments and other business decisions with financial impact of at least 20 million. Prior to PG&E, John was a litigation economist where he provided economic and financial consulting services. John received a BA in applied mathematics and rhetoric from UC Berkeley, a master's in public policy from Harvard, and an MBA from Wharton. John is joining us from San Francisco. Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for Boston, Chelsea, Riviera, and Winthrop, Massachusetts. She is the first woman ever elected as District Attorney in Suffolk County and the first woman of color ever elected to serve in this role in Massachusetts. Since taking office, Rowling has um, implemented humane and data-supported policies to keep Suffolk County safe, policies that no longer criminalize mental health issues, substance use disorders, food and housing insecurities, and immigration status, instead focusing her limited resources on the most violent and serious crimes. Rollins was a Governor Devil Patrick appointee to the Judicial Nominating Commission, a past president of the Massachusetts Black Lawyers Association, and served a three-year term on the Boston Bar, Bar Association Council. D. Rollins is joining us from Boston. Thank you all for joining us. We are so honored to have you here. Today's panel discussion is about racism, why we must solve it in technology. We will be exploring how technology can improve the treatment of racial groups and their interactions with the police and criminal justice system, improve equity in education, improve financial opportunities, and many more. So, what is racism? A system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race. Racism in all its horrific forms in, is transmitted across generations and is manifested in individual behaviors, institutional norms and practices, and cultural values and patterns. Racism serves simultaneously both to rationalize the hierarchical domination of one race or ethnic group over another group and maintain psychological, social, and material advantages for the dominant group. The killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, and the loss of far too many Black lives to list have left our nation anguished and outraged. While now is the time to grief and anger, it is also a time for resolution. The world needs changing. Institutional racism, also known as systemic racism, is a form of racism which is embedded as normal practice within society or in an organization. It can lead to such issues as discrimination in criminal justice, employment, housing, healthcare, political power, education, technology, among other issues. Apologies ahead. Due to the time limitation, we will only be addressing a few aspects of systemic racism at our webinar today. We often call on technology to help solve problems, but when society defines frames and represents people of color as the problem, those solutions often do more harm than good. 
we designed the facial recognition technologies that target criminal suspects on the basis of skin color. We have trained automated risk profiling systems that disproportionately identify Latinx people as illegal immigrants. We have devised credit scoring algorithm that disproportionately identify black people as risk and prevent them from buying homes, getting loans or finding jobs. So the question we have to confront is whether we will continue to design and deploy tools that serve the interests of racism and white supremacy. As pressure on tech companies builds in response to the killing of George Floyd by a police officer, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM are stepped away from their homegrown facial recognition technologies. IBM was the first domino with plans on exiting the facial recognition business. Amazon is getting in place a one-year hold on police departments using its facial recognition technology. And Microsoft is waiting on new legislation before it starts selling a comparable product to law enforcement. If we don't want our technology to be used to perpetuate racism, then we must make sure that we don't conflict social problems like crime or violence or disease with black and brown people. When we do that, we risk turning those people into the problems that we deploy our technology to solve the threat, we design it to eradicate. So technology can play an important role to address systemic racism. The first question is for DA Rollins. I will start with sharing some relevant context and statistics and then move on to the question. A Stanford University study that analyzed 93 million traffic stops in the United States revealed that African Americans are 20% more likely to be stopped. The United States has the highest prison population rate in the world, 706 per 100,000 of national population. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, Black Americans are over represented in the country's incarcerated population. In 2018, Black inmates made up roughly 33% of the country's prison population, yet just 12% of the U.S. total population. White inmates, meanwhile, made up 30% of the prison population and 60% of the country's total population. FBI arrest data show that Black Americans also make up the majority of the suspects arrested and charged with violent crimes such as murder and robbery, which generally carry lengthy sentences. But criminal justice reform advocates have argued that even taking crime rates into account, Black Americans still experience unequal treatment in the justice system compared to their white counterparts. For instance, Black Americans are much more likely to get arrested on drug charges than uh, white Americans, even though usage rates are comparable. Once arrested, Black defendants are more likely than white defendants to be denied bail and more likely to receive harsher charges and sentences than white defendants who committed the same offenses, according to the sentencing project. The most recent numbers available on imprisonment rates come with the Bureau of Justice statistics analysis of 2018 data, which showed that Black men aged 18 to 19 were 12.7 times more likely to be imprisoned as their white peers, and Black men of all ages were roughly 5.8 times more likely to be imprisoned than white men. So the question is, um, how can technology improve the treatment of racial groups and their interactions with the police and criminal justice system? Is there a need to repeal qualified immunity for the police or should technology address the current gap? Thank you for letting me be here uh, and involved in this conversation. And I appreciate you taking um, the time to have a member of law enforcement on this. Um, all those statistics you just rattled off are precisely why I decided to run for district attorney. Um, a lot of people in this moment in this country are looking at police as being the sole bad actors. They are not. Yes, Derek Chauvin is the person who put his knee um, on George Floyd's neck and in eight minutes and 46 seconds tried, convicted, sentenced, and executed that man. And that's not the way our criminal legal system works. But there were district attorneys 
that looked at that and took far too long to charge and undercharged, right? When we think about Ahmad Arbery and we see that the McMichaels family, the father and son and their neighbor or friend hunted Ahmad, we all saw the videos of white people walking into that abandoned property. They weren't killed. Uh, white children going into that abandoned property. They weren't hunted. Um, but when we all watch that video in horror of that execution, of that lynching, right? Um, three district attorneys watched that and said, nope, looks perfectly fine because Georgia has a citizen's arrest statute. And it took the Georgia Bureau of Investigations to come in and within 24 hours, they arrested the McMichaels as well as their, uh, his, their, their joint venturer and co-defendant. So when we look at technology though, just in the last few days, look what happened in Detroit with um, a man, Robert Williams, who, um, you know, the police, apparently a, a person stole five watches from a watch store with a value of approximately $3,800. Um, the police looked at security video, they took some grainy footage, and they put it into a facial recognition technology um, program, and out pops Robin Williams, he was arrested in front of his wife and two children, his young daughters, two and five years old. They were crying and traumatized about this. He had been at work for four years without, I think several years without an absence and was held there. Um, so I don't think data should um, be something that we look at, certainly as a visibly brown person. I am not looking at facial recognition technology. Um, and the technology might appear to be race neutral on its face, but the people entering the algorithms and making those determinations and writing that code um, are frequently not black and brown people. And that's why black women aren't even recognized by some of these facial technology um, uh, entities. So I think qualified immunity is something we have to look at on its own. Um, I think we can certainly use data and technology um, to mitigate uh, but not sort of amplify um, racial bias. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's what I would say right now, but give the experts an opportunity to speak. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, DA Rollins. Kevin, would you like to add? Yes, uh, I would like to say, you know, the data part is very important and I, I definitely want to distinguish like facial recognition software and things of that nature because that's not having you know, black people, particularly on the product side of devising these products will make, will lead to these things where things like that happen. But as far as what the Congressional Black Caucus and other people and legislation are trying to do, as far as tracking where these incidents occur with police officers getting um, disciplined at various police departments, then being able to switch and move over to a different community and become a police officer again. Um, having a database and, and ways of tracking these incidences are going to lead to more storytelling about how these disparities occur and how they negatively impact black people um, is going to be very important. So nationalizing a database of police officers and keeping track of these incidents so that um, district attorneys, et cetera, have the data that they can say, look, why are African-Americans being pulled over three times more in these particular communities? Why are they looking for these types of offenses, whereas other people are able to get away scot-free for doing the same ex exact crimes in different area codes? And you, to your point, uh, Kevin, a white officer in New Jersey, the New York Times just had an article about this, um, was caught on video pepper spraying a group of black youths come to find out he had worked in nine different police departments and New Jersey had no idea about that because there's no central database tracking police abuse. Um, any databases that we have on the state level can't be voluntary. They must be mandatory and certainly at the federal level with respect to officer involved shootings, excessive force. I agree with you. I'm not as smart as you guys about all the data stuff but I can tell you um, you know I do think it's important and it can't be let us know if you want because who's going to self-report we need mandatory reporting but very good point sir excellent uh, before we move on to the next question anyone else would like to add yeah sure I'd like to jump in there and, and also let me say thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate on the panel as well uh, but uh, I um, when these instances of 
occur. It seems that uh, you know police officers conveniently uh, turn their cameras off or uh, say that they were they had fallen off. I was actually just discussing with my wife this morning a story of a of a young man who was killed in Colorado a year ago, and a video just became uh, available recently. But anyway. Uh, there were three officers on the scene and all three of them said that their cameras fell off. And um, so it, it just seems interesting uh, how uh, the evidence can, can mysteriously disappear. And so I think uh, there should be laws that require police officers to wear cameras and, and maybe even beyond that, uh, embed the cameras in their badges or in, in, in some way where they actually can't be removed. And we've got technology that's advanced enough now where you know, maybe the camera's automatically activated when the officer exits the car or when the police officer is called out, uh, you know, to the scene of an incident. So, uh, so that's one point. And another point is I think, um, you know, I just uh, watched this movie, um, I can't remember, remember the name of it, but uh, the gentleman who was in, in prison and, uh, and a law student, uh, you know, saved the day and came in and uh, Yes, got him mercy. Yes, mercy. Yes, mercy. Yes, mercy. And so uh, I, I think what, what his uh, law firm was trying to do was part of a larger effort to sort of scour the, uh, the court records and the legal records to find instances where abuse may have occurred, where wrongful convictions may have occurred. So I think we, we now have the technology to industrialize all of that. We, we, we can now scour every single record in the country, probably in a matter of you know, days or weeks. Uh, and so I think uh, that's another way that technology can really help, uh, you know, exonerate uh, or, or make more fair uh, the justice system. And, and if I could, you know, when what I'm proud of is we see mayors um, who David McAtee was a, a, a citizen. Um, unfortunately, I think it happened in the same place where George Floyd was killed. There were protests and the police shot into the crowd. None of those officers, all of them had body cams, none of them were, were on, and they were all fired, right? Now, whether that ultimately ends up being a crime is you know, an additional step that the legislature would have to take, but we have the ability right now, people, with bold city managers and bold mayors to say, even with unions, that's it. You don't have, you know, the same way pilots have to have a checklist, doctors have to have a checklist before they do things. When we think about Breonna Taylor, a no-knock warrant in Louisville, Kentucky, the person they were looking for had been arrested earlier in the day. When you have a surgery, the doctor says, Rachel, it's your right shoulder, right? And I say yes, and then I sign the piece of paper that says right shoulder, and then they write surgery here, and then they write on this shoulder, don't operate on this shoulder. So like, there's 52 checks to make sure they get it right. Why aren't we requiring law enforcement to do that? Okay. Before you no-knock and bust a door open, and of course, Brianna was asleep. Her boyfriend had a license to carry because I'd like to remind everyone on the panel, the Second Amendment applies to Black people too, and we can have guns lawfully, um, even though it's harder than us for us to get licenses, et cetera, but that's another panel. Um, he shot at the people breaking through the door because he thought they were being robbed. They returned fire. Brianna's killed. Eight shots in her bed. No arrests made yet. That happened over 100 days ago. Um, and, you know, the individual they were looking for had already been detained, detained by law enforcement. We have lots of systemic failures. That is data or technology that just could have been checked before they went in. That, does, that, that doesn't even require a computer. It just would have needed a phone. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Roger. Okay. <clears throat> so, so we got started here with technology. And I want to move over to policy and how we, uh, how we affect change there. Um, I want to set a little context here. While the 116th Congress, which came into session after the 2018 midterm election, was the most diverse ever, only 57 of the current 535 voting members of Congress are Black. Since African Americans are only 13.4% of the U.S. population from the 2019 census, uh, even at full representation in Congress, they cannot set or sufficiently influence race policy. Moreover, politicians of both parties are heavily influenced by lobbyists and special interests who effectively buy influence in Washington, D.C. Because African Americans have approximately 10% of the wealth of white Americans, they cannot influence policy through this political channel either. On balance, this leaves African Americans underrepresented in Washington, D.C. So my question is, how can technology provide the information that we need to shape politics and policy? And I would like Kevin to, to start with this question. Thank you. Um, so I've given this some thought. This is something that I've struggled with for a number of years. Um, the, political, the current political climate has changed a little bit 
our traditional red and blue, historically red and blue states are no longer um, the same anymore. A lot of them are up for grabs these days. Nonetheless, uh, California pretty much, New York pretty much are gonna remain the same as far as being blue states on national presidential elections. So it's ironic that a lot of other states have elections that affect black people on a national level that we really rarely know about unless uh, cable news uh, amplifies it or highlights what's going on. So technology can be used in a way to kind of gather data, find local people that are running for local office, statewide office, um, even uh, the Senate and Congress, so that we know some of these um, smaller elections that may sway, you know, whether or not we have a majority in the House or whether or not we have a majority in the Senate. Knowing about who these candidates are, what, they, what their um, track record is regarding different things that they voted for, if they've already been an elected official running for higher office or an incumbent, and then also being able to, to measure their track record up with an agenda that's sensitive to black people in this country. Um, there's not a one unilateral organization like the NAACP or other organizations in the past where we kind of had a more of a united black voice, but nonetheless, there are certain issues that we all can agree to that um, we would like basic um, needs and basic services for, for black people. So technology can be used to do all that. And um, I've always said, well, with these blue states or red states, if you want, that already know where they're going as far as who they're gonna vote for, they can be used to make phone calls, emails, um, create petitions, et cetera, for different elections in different states that may affect them. There are, I just wanted to point out, there's a company out there called Politiscope that I'm familiar with. Uh, one of the founders is one of my fraternity brothers, but there are about four or five uh, ex NFL players who came together, pulled their money together and started an app that basically does what I'm talking about in many ways. They actually look at what bills are actually on the floor right now, who introduced them, um, if there's been votes, which Congress people have voted on different bills that are out there. And it also provides their contact information of the, the individuals who voted so that people that are aware of what's going on can actually contact those representatives and say, hey, why did you vote this way? Or have some type of accountability. And then lastly, what I would say regarding the technology aspect of things, looking at what the civil unrest that's been occurring in the last several weeks is very encouraging and seeing people to the thousands taking the streets and protesting. Now you can use technology to uh, also provide the, the vehicle and the environment to create the change that we need. Like I said, via text messages, via email, via other ways to put political pressure on individuals to do the right thing um, at the right time. Great, great. So we talked about accountability. We talked a little bit about advocacy for the right, uh, right choices. Uh, Rachel, I was wondering if you could add to this this conversation. Uh, okay. So just, I mean, I I agree. I when I look at running for office, um, I'm an elected position as DA. Remember, all the problems we're seeing, the unrest. People think it's the police, which of course the police aren't elected. Mayors are, or or city managers are appointed or city councilors that then appoint the city manager. Um, and they, they appoint the chief of police. When I ran for office, all of the national organizations that endorsed me used technology and data to mobilize people to, to recognize how important the role of DA was. So I think we can, just to echo what Kevin said, I think there are many ways that we should be um, alerting people about opportunities um, to use data in, in a positive way. I, I will say, I think somebody mentioned it, but some of the bail um, questions that I come up with all the time or, or district attorneys um, or US attorneys or um, attorney generals. So district attorneys are for the counties and smaller areas. Attorney generals are for the state. And then US attorneys are, you know, you, you, most every state has one attorney general. Some have multiple US attorneys on the federal level, but we might use an algorithm for bail um, yeah, I just wanna make sure you guys are aware the same problems we see with facial tech, uh, recognition technology are, in the, are embedded in the problems with, um, with bail. That, that's what I would say. 
Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, next question is for, is for Stacey Clark. Um, a 2019 study by executive staffing firm Chris Colbert uh, Associates, Associates looked at uh, the CEOs of Fortune 500 and S&P 500 companies. Only 8.7% of uh, the 675 companies in the study had CEOs of color. As of 2020, only four Fortune 500 companies have black CEOs. Kenneth Fraser of uh, Mark and Kong, uh, Marvin Ellison of Lowe's, uh, Jai Jaitlin of uh, Tape Street, and uh, Roger Ferguson Jr. for TIAA. And please note that zero black women in the list. The Center uh, for Talent Innovations uh, being back Black in Corporate America report released in late 2018 found that Black people account for only 3.2% of senior leadership roles at large corporations. The study also found an overall lack of mentorship and access to senior leaders. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, in 2018, the average Black worker earned just 62% of what the average white worker made, and a Black woman earned just 66% what the typical white man made annually. So the question is, how can a corporate leadership play a vital role and address racial discrimination? Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the reasons I was attracted to having a career in technology was diversity. I wanted to um, go into an organization where there were people from all over the world um, and uh, there was different perspectives. And that, I think, is the case uh, when you go into a lot of tech companies and you look at the individual contributors. And as I um, continue to get promoted through my career, I started to realize that the meetings that I was in became more male, became more white, until um, I pretty much was sitting in a room of senior managers that were white men and myself. And um, it became, it, it, I found that there were, um, continued as I go with, went up the leadership um, path, there was, it was more and more difficult um, in terms of the, uh, the people that were kind of targeting me to see how they could kind of knock me out of the game. So we know that it, racial discrimination exists in technology companies. We know it exists in corporations. Um, I've always been an advocate. I had no problem going to my management and saying, these are the problems that I see. Right now, I think we have a lot of uh, leadership that is um, standing up and saying this is wrong and we will not tolerate it. Uh, but that's not enough. Um, saying that you have empathy is not enough. That doesn't get us anywhere. What, um, what really needs to happen is there is a conversation of how do we make change within our organization. We, we don't have clear procedures. I'd always hear, oh, Stacey, I'm so sorry for you. Maybe you're overreacting. Um, we're gonna look into this. This is very important. But none of that is a policy. That's not a procedure that is shared on your intranet or your internal network to really say, this is how we are going to handle it. And not just for the person that is experiencing it, but those that also see it happening around them. And I also think it's important for those that feel because there's a lot of people within these organizations that are extremely angry. They feel that, you know, highlighting Black lives is um, uh, uh, reverse racism. And it's not, if we don't address that as well, it's just going to bubble up and fester. And it's going to be taken out in a way that could be disastrous for the entire corporation. So the procedures that need to be in place need to be voiced by the leaders to say, here's what happened. Step one, step two, step three. This is how we're gonna follow up on, on it. And if you are one of, if you are a victim, if you've seen this happen to others, or you feel so angry right now that you feel like you are now becoming um, a victim of reverse racism, we need to talk about it. We need to have these conversations and we need to move forward. One of the, the things that um, I, got from some of my CTO um, colleagues, I asked them, how do you hire and bring on um, businesses of color? How do you find out about um, the expanding who people see within the office? 
And one of the things I thought was really, really pretty interesting is most CTOs have told me, you know, I use my network. I use my network to find tech talent. I find my network to find consulting services and businesses. And I ask them, well, who's your network? And they go, oh, my network is other CTOs. I have a group of CTOs that we, we pull from and we get these ideas. And I, I asked them, well, is it the same network where I went to a CTO company party? And, and they're like, oh yeah, that's our network. And let me tell you, I went to that networking party and if there were a hundred CTOs there, 98 of them were white men. So when you look at a network that you're pulling from, which is 98% white men, then there is no opportunity for businesses like mine to, to actually be able to expand and get the opportunity to bid on projects and bid on contracts. And so what I recommend for corporate leaders is one, you have to be vocal in how you're going to take action, but two, expand your network. A lot of companies have supplier diversity supplier portals with thousands of um, businesses of color. And all they have to do is call or email that the diversity inclusion officer and say, hey, I don't want to have um, a candidate list that is only my network. I need to expand it. Please send me over some qualified other businesses so that we can get them in there. It's very, it may be difficult to very quickly have a lot of executives and um, of color at the highest level, even though we need to get there. Um, but it is, it is also valuable to bring in businesses that can, that can be within that office and show that yes, Racism um, is festered if we don't have diversity and we don't see people uh, that don't look like us and bring that perspective. Thank you, Stacey. Um, from the panel, Angela, would you like to add? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, you know, I'll echo a lot of the you know great comments that Stacey just made. You know, over the years, I've spoken with so many diversity-focused organizations actually tackling this problem head-on to try and learn from their experiences and what I was you know met with was a lot of discouragement like most of them feel like there was no meaningful change that's really happened in the last five years or longer um, but one thing that I heard was that the single biggest predictor of whether a company was actually serious about diversity initiatives was whether the CEO had made public statements committing to diversity um, because I think in a real way the culture and the openness for that does start at the top but you know as Stacy mentioned the statistics still haven't changed despite all of that. Um, and so some of the dynamics at play there is that companies will hire a chief diversity officer, officer and then give them zero budget to actually like invest in solutions or zero power to actually enforce real change. So it seems like progress, but it's really surface level. Um, you know, a head recruiter at one of the biggest tech companies in the Valley told me that it was important for Scoutable not to pitch them as a diversity solution because then it would only get used when they were specifically looking for a token hire because they already had solutions like that and that's how they use them. So I think leadership plays a, plays a role, but I think employees really have to reset some of those racist cultural norms that are just pervasive in our organizations. Um, and you know, in a real level, also like who does the leadership answer to and it's the board, right? So the board also has to demand it and to change the leadership. But really, I think the, the biggest thing that you know, all of us can really do is I think customers actually need to demand it. And that's what we're seeing today in the sort of widespread aspect of this movement. So companies, what I've learned over the years, they really only change for business reasons, for like bottom line business reasons. And so when customers speak with their dollars, it actually creates real justification for making dramatic changes in business practices. So I've always felt and advocated that this change would have to come from a grassroots movement. And I'm like very excited that we're finally seeing that wave of change in what feels like a very real way now. And it feels like, you know, a real shot to break through these entrenched systems. Thank you, Angela. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, Angela, we're gonna uh, follow up on this question. Uh, and I wanna set some context here. Just as a black employment has historically been lower than, than white, the unemployment rate for black Americans has been higher. In 2019, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the employment rate among black Americans was 49.6% and uh, the employment rate for whites was 53.4%. The unemployment rate among black Americans was 16.8% and for whites is 12.4%. Now, Elon Musk, kind of, kind of taking from uh, what we had said in the last question, is a CEO has said uh, he's willing to hire people without a college degree. 
and setting that policy for how he hires in his company. So I wanted to know if you could speak to, to uh, what that means for recruiting and how technology uh, can identify good candidate, candidates and how we can train good candidates, what that means for the pipeline in terms of getting employees and how that also might uh, impact diversity. Yeah, so, you know, actually Tesla is just one of the many companies making that policy change. Google, Apple, IBM, Bank of America, so, so many others have actually come out and stated this policy change that they no longer require college degrees. And, you know, like I said a moment ago, the reason for this move is actually not all that noble. It's actually a logical business decision. So if we look across the job market, more than half of hires fail. And there's a large body of research showing that factors like educational pedigree um, and even work experience are actually poor predictors of future performance on the job. So companies are realizing that relying on these biased criteria are actually giving them worse hiring outcomes than if they just flipped a coin um, in a real way. So I actually spent years at, at Harvard leading research unpacking these dynamics on the job market. Um, and on the racism topic, reliance on educational pedigree on the job market is actually one of the biggest factors driving social inequality. So today, education is actually used as a primary sorting mechanism in the US job market. Um, but where you went to school is actually most directly correlated with your socioeconomic background. So this is like systemic racism 101. Like if you weren't born wealthy, then it's much less likely that you'll go to a top school. And if you don't go to top schools, let alone don't get to go to college at all, then you're not competitive for top paying jobs. And then your children are born wealthy, so it's less likely that they're able to go to top schools, and the vicious inequality cycle just repeats itself. So this reliance on education not only misallocates people and talent from every socioeconomic group, evidenced by you know, the statistics that we see um, in, in hiring failure rates, um, but I think the biggest thing is the fallacy of education as a sort of proxy for worker value on the job market is really what cements social inequality into our society's like social fabric. Um, I actually entitled my, uh, my Harvard research Invisible Handcuffs to represent this reality that we all live in today. So what I've been advocating for years is that technology is probably the only chance we have, have as a society to break those gates at, at a systemic level and actually democratize the hiring process. Um, so to go back to your question, Removing co college degrees as a requirement is a meaningful and a, and a logical step. But this leaves a big hole in what companies actually can and will use as the evaluation criteria amongst you know, a large sea of job applicants. So that was the other question we broached um, in the Harvard research. You know, if we know educational pedigree and work background are the wrong criteria, then what's the right criteria? Um, and the fascinating thing is that the right criteria has actually been known for a very long time as well. So there's this whole robust body of academic research that shows that the umbrella of qualities that we call soft skills, um, I really don't like that term, but soft skills, it's basically scientifically measured personality and cognitive attributes are actually the single most predictive information about future performance on any job. You know, at a minimum, two times more predictive than interviews, three times more predictive than work experience, four times more predictive than education level, and nearly 90% of hiring failures are actually due to solely to soft skill mismatch. And the critical aspect there is that someone's natural personality and cognitive attributes are completely uncorrelated with their socioeconomic background. So what we find is that the most predictive information for future performance on any job also completely levels the playing field across race, across gender, across age, across socioeconomic background. So, you know, it's kind of this holy grail of, of, of criteria. But, you know, if that's the case, if this is the best data for, for business reasons, then why isn't every company using this information? Well, it's because the way that um, we traditionally measure these attributes about people is, uh, is traditional testing, like psychological type testing. Um, and those tests actually take many hours and sometimes full days of psychological testing to actually get enough data to have like those predictive outcomes that the academic research has found. So that was never gonna be top time or cost feasible at scale for companies. And so this is really where the technology comes in. So for this context, this problem specifically, we needed a technology that can not only measure and uncover these qualities about all candidates, um, but then also credibly communicate to employers that a candidate who might not have any of the traditional background or signals that they're used to looking for is actually a perfect fit based on this most predictive data. So, you know, 
our technology, for example, Scoutable, we created the, what you know is the first version of a um, of a, a short twenty minute assessment that actually replaces the hours of traditional testing. Um, because we knew the data we needed, and we knew that you could get it using traditional testing, but we needed a technology solution to actually make that scalable and economically feasible at scale um, for all companies. So, you know, I, Scoutable is the only technology I'm aware of that solved both the scalability and the cost barriers to actually rewiring our job hiring process on a systemic level. And, you know, we've already seen this happening. Like, for example, one of the companies using Scoutable to hire for an engineer they were getting applications from you know, top CS grads at Stanford and MIT and you know, all the top schools. But then the best candidate that matched on that, on the soft skills, on the most predictive information was, um, was actually like a big surprise to them. So it was a, a candidate of a Hispanic background who'd actually never been to college um, and worked as a full-time auto technician in a garage. So this person had never even worked in an office before. Um, but had done a coding boot camp and learned how to code uh, on their own. And, you know, based on the data, it showed that this person is actually the most similar to all of their top engineers, you know, traditional looking mm -hmm. top engineers. So they took the chance and hired him over the fancy resumes and he became one of their all time top engineers. And, you know, I think, you know, I'm so grateful that this movement is actually f serving as the forcing function that many companies need to dramatically change this broken entrenched system. Like getting companies to adopt new technology and hiring is, is pretty much the only way I see that we can break, break the systemic racism that is rampant in the, in the job market. Okay, I wanna see if we can get Stacy in on this question. And, and I wanna also add that you know, I, I served in the military before I, before I was, uh, went to university and the, and the military does a, a, a whole lot of training when they hire somebody to make sure that they can do a certain job regardless of what, what their demographic group that they come from. And so I'm hoping that Stacy can maybe also speak to what we might do in terms of using training and using technology to train the, once you get a, a person that is a good fit and it is a culture or, or or at least a good company fit, how might you use technology to train? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. First of all, I, I want to um, congratulate Angela on the work that you've done. That it, that's incredible and awesome. My HR always asks me why, um, you know, when we're hiring developers for our company, I don't get into tech questions. Um, I really get uh, to know them. And we also do uh, use Emergenetics to really understand the other qualities um, and behavioral side. So kudos to you. Um, I. I want to address kind of the feeling that I had when I when when companies started to move towards no college degree required. Um, there's good and bad. Um, we can level the playing field, but there's also, and to Angela's term, uh, fallacy of education. A lot of us as uh, minorities, as women, were told if you go to school, if you get a college degree, then you're going to have these opportunities. And so, seeing that now that is not a criteria. I, I get a little nervous that um, we move into um, a, a playing field where now, as we have less white men graduating from college, we don't have a criteria that we can say, listen, we hit this criteria, so this should give us an opportunity. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's very important in the work that Angela is doing to um, be able to make sure we have fair criteria. There's a lot of, I don't like him because he's not a good cultural fit. Or as you had mentioned, he, this person is very similar to everyone else at the company. That's what we're looking for. May not always be what's going to allow you to have diverse perspectives you need to compete and, and, and make your company competitive and innovative in the future. So there's good and bad. We just have to, I think the good outweighs the bad. We just have to make sure that cultural fit of, that cultural fit kind of, I don't think he is a good fit here or she's a good fit here doesn't um, eliminate opportunities for um, uh, people of color. Um, but once you, uh, once you get the job, um, that's where it really begins. And in my opinion, um, tech is a very hands-on industry. It's a hands-on um, experience. I got my degree in computer science from Stanford, and I got to tell you, day one, I, if it wasn't for the internships that I had um, working as a developer and tester for big companies, I still felt like, you know, I, I was a ground level in terms of what it takes to, to be um, 
a strong, a strong candidate, a strong hire. And so really uh, this goes into the mentorship that we'll, I think we're talking about, but mentorship in a level where it's not, um, to kind of Angela's point, it's in those soft skills as well. It's okay to be like, hey, I can help you with your code. I can help you develop your code. But really what makes a strong candidate and, and the way we develop our consultants um, in our company is really around how do you communicate? How do you collaborate? How are you working with others? How are you working through problems? And so that part is, is something that needs to be ingrained and also um, focus on the people that may not always get that opportunity, especially people of color, to, to develop those skills along with, um, uh, with leadership and uh, driving that. Okay, great. Thank you, Stacy and uh, Angela. Um, so uh, next question again for Stacy. Um, a study by the Department of Education showed that in 2013, black high school students were only a bit more than half as likely as white students to have an, any advanced placement or international baccalaureate credit and only about a third as likely to have uh, AP IB credit for math. Uh, the share of uh, both black and uh, white Americans with college degrees have increased dramatically over the last half century. But uh, there is uh, still a gap, according to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2018. 35.2% uh, uh, of white and 25.2% uh, of black age, uh, 25 or older, have a completed a uh, college degree. The pipeline is part of the problem. If fewer black children go to schools with robust resources or even math and science classes in high school, then there will be fewer students who have the support and credentials to go to the college. Even though the government desegregated schools uh, 66 years ago, about half of the students in the U.S. still attend either predominantly white or non-white schools, according to a 2019 report from a nonprofit group, Edville. And the differences between these schools are still visible. For every student enrolled, the average non-white school district receives um, uh, over uh, $22,000 uh, less than a white school district. So the question uh, for Stacy here, um, how can technology improve equity in education and educational opportunities both in current pandemic and once it ends? Yeah. Well, one of the things I think a lot of us, especially parents have learned during the pandemic is that we make terrible teachers. Um, I, I think uh, one of, that was one of my nightmares to have to be a homeschool uh, instructor and, um, I, <laughs> and uh, it's been very difficult. But what I also realized was that um, my student or my daughter um, no longer has to be bound by getting an education from just her second grade teacher. She now has the world of opportunity open to her. Um, she can, we can find the best Spanish instruction in the world and make that her course. Um, so when we look at schools that are underfunded, that don't have any teachers for computer science, IP physics, um, the pandemic has, I believe, helped us see that you can still, maybe not at the same level, but um, you can still offer instruction that is going to be valuable to help develop um, our secondary and primary education in areas where um, it's weak. And as I, and I think beyond um, primary and secondary, as we look to college, one of the things that I found so valuable uh, is that we have now these online self-led instruction <clears throat> for how you can learn how to code, learn how to um, do test automation. One of my colleagues, um, Angie Jones, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my colleagues, Angie Jones, has created something called Test Automation University. This was an area where if you didn't know it yourself, if you didn't work for three years and someone showed you how to do it, there was no way for you to know how to do test automation. So she created a free online test automation university program. 50,000 people have now taken those free courses and are in developing who they are. So we, we really have made good progress here. Um, the goal now is for us to use our educators at every level to say, 
you know what, we, are, we can break free from saying we don't have enough resources. We can expand and look at other ways for us to teach our students in ways that we, we may not be able to provide given the budget and resources that we have. Mahanora, can I just add something? But sure, I think please. with COVID-19, and I agree, um, let me make something very clear, Stacey. I have three children and I've said to all of them, you're redoing whatever grades you were supposed to be in because I want teachers to get raises, et cetera. But I think COVID-19 has really shown, even with the best of intentions with technology, due to all of the systemic racism and the wealth gaps, um, I have a 16-year-old daughter that is my own daughter. She goes to an independent school here in Cambridge, Buckingham, Brown and Nichols that I went to. I am the guardian of two of my nieces as a result of siblings that have unfortunately cycled in and out of the criminal legal system. They are in public school and the disparities between the private education, my, literally we got a state of emergency in Massachusetts, I think on March 11th. On March 12th, my daughter at Buckingham Brown and Nichols, everything was online. Everyone has a laptop, Nobody's worrying about Wi-Fi. Um, you know, we've seen in Boston alone, guys, 20% of the Boston public schools children haven't even logged on since it happened. And our, our implicit bias might be saying, oh, they're bad kids and they don't. No, their parents, if they're black and brown and poor, those are the essential workers that kept us alive at supermarkets. Those are the ones that pick up our trash and work um, in sanitation. They work in restaurants. And so it, it is, I want this to end on a positive note, but when, when we hear that data can do great things for us and technology is wonderful, we still have too many people that can't even get there because they can't afford a laptop and if they do get given one, because our mayor gave out 30,000 laptops to the Boston Public Schools, they don't have Wi-Fi. Or we have communities in Massachusetts, overwhelmingly black, brown, immigrant communities, where there are, I'm not joking, families living in a three bedroom apartment, a family in each of those bedrooms, and they don't have access to a kitchen in places like Chelsea, where even if they do have Wi-Fi, and you guys are smart about this, but the system is, so, the, the signal is so weak that they can't even, you know, get on to these classes. So we, we, I want us to keep talking about this, but it's a matter of we have to be doing so many things at the same time because there are too many people, overwhelmingly poor and black and brown, that aren't even getting to the exceptional stuff that we're talking about right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, 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 it's, it's a starting point, but there's definitely a long way to go. Yeah. I just Thank wanted you, to add a go couple ahead, Kevin. to this. Um, you know, and I was going to say what Rachel said, so thanks for um, saving me my breath. But, but and it's Kappa the, Alpha Psi, right? I, of course I know. Day, I'm I a Delta, but go ahead, Kevin. But um, what I would also like to say regarding this is my business partner, Dr. Brian Brown, is a professor at Stanford and he teaches teachers how to teach science education to underrepresented students of color. That's his PhD program. So in addition to converting our programs, which we create pipeline programs for young people to get interested in STEM at a young age, to fall in love with it actually, we've had to convert our program to a virtual experience. So we have, we've gotten a donation from First Republic Bank to get laptop computers for our students. We've talked to Comcast about their 30, I think it's a 30 or 60 days that they provide free internet service to kids to be able to participate on online schooling, et cetera. But the problem that we face and that we have in this space is that the school system is just broken. We have, we're under enrolled. We've expanded to a national platform since we can have any kid that has computer and Wi-Fi can participate in our summer program and we don't have access to reach the students the school districts don't know how to reach the students barely the schools know how to send the information to register for the program to the students so even though there are programs out there that exist that can help people get into STEM and we do traditional STEM so everything's going towards coding and software but what we neglect to think is that school and college is still an option for kids to go uh, to create a career if you can't get past math 1A, chemistry 1A, or physics 1A, you're probably going to be a social science major. So our goal really is to get young people interested in STEM at a young age, but we can't even reach them. So there are a lot of different problems that we need to, to fix in this pipeline to get people into tech. Thank you, Kevin. 
Let's All move right. on to the next one. All right, John Scott, I want to ask you a question here. Um, let me set a little context here. When black mortgage applications uh, tried to get try to get financing from banks, uh, they they were more like they are more likely to be denied denied loans uh, than aspiring homeowners of other races. More of our social networks, social services, and cultural inclusion in a community can impact the real cost of purchasing a home and impact segregation. While former discrimination for home loans has been illegal in the U.S. for decades, the ongoing divide in mortgage approval rates shows that more informal practices uh, are still in effect. On conventional home purchase loans, the turnover differentials were stark. Uh, black applicants received denials 19.3% of the time, while the rate for non-Hispanic whites was 7.9%. Wealth and financial stability are inextricably linked to housing opportunity and ownership. For a typical family, the larger share of their wealth emanates from home ownership and home equity. So the question we have for you is, how can technology make financial opportunities uh, that is mortgage loans more inclusive? Sure, and thanks for that, Roger. So uh, I, I want to start off by highlighting, uh, and I think all of, all of us know it, that um, the wealth gap is probably um, the, uh, the most important gap that we have. Uh, I'd say that combined with the gap in political power. And, and I say that because with wealth, uh, you can actually, uh, as we've been seeing lately, purchase political power. Uh, but at any rate, even without purchasing it directly, uh, you're just more likely to get voted in office and so forth. Uh, and also with political power, you can then you know, set laws and policies and you know, just tilt the playing field in all kinds of ways that allow you to accumulate more wealth. So, uh, so that, that's number one. And, and then number two is that the, the wealth gap is massive. Uh, you mentioned a statistic earlier, Roger, that, uh, that white families uh, have 10 times more wealth than black families. So I think that that's a huge thing to keep in mind. That's, that's the, the uh, magnitude of the problem that we're confronting. Uh, the next uh, uh, thing that I wanna highlight is that the wealth gap is persistent over time. So if you look back over the last 30 years, uh, that, that 10X number that you mentioned, it it's, may have gone uh, as low as 5X and it may have gone as high as say 17, 20X, depending on what kind of data you look at. Uh, so it's persistent. Uh, I actually uh, read some information that when, uh, when black folks were released from slavery, that at that point in time, they owned about half a percent of the wealth of the country. And today they own about half a percent of the wealth of the country. So in the entire history uh, of the United States, since we've been, uh, since black folks have been released from slavery, our, our wealth position has gone almost nowhere. Now, just a caveat on that, I, I did read something, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the 1619 Project, it's a magazine in the New York Times, as well as some other things, as well as curriculum. Uh, there was a statistic that blacks currently own 3% of the wealth of the United States, but no matter how you position it, uh, it's clear that we, we just have a disproportionate low share of the nation's wealth. Uh, and then another thing, and I, I think a few, a few of you have hinted on this, is that uh, the wealth gap, like other gaps, like the income gap, uh, is resistant to education. So if you look at, you know, people with a high school uh, diploma, uh, there's a $60,000 wealth difference between black families and white families. If you look at people with a, uh, a bachelor's degree, uh, there's a $225,000 gap between um, white families and black families. And if you look at folks with a graduate degree, there's a $450,000 difference between white families and black families. So uh, I think that that just exposes uh, the myth that we can educate ourselves out of the, uh, out of the problem that we're confronting. Uh, and I, I'd say go beyond that. It's, it, it's, it's not possible to, um, to in, uh, put in place any particular policy or suite of policies that's going to pull us out of this. So uh, you know, I say I'll have to tee up um, a discussion about um, what can we do. So when, when I think about what we can do uh, practically, uh, some of the things that we can do, we've already done. So I think about what the right thing is to do, what's, what's a feasible thing to do. Uh, but some of the things we have been done, we just need to, I think, do them at a larger scale. So uh, focusing on housing, for example. So, you know, the logical thing to do would be to try to increase access to housing. And you can do that by, you know, offering attractive interest rates and discounts on interest rates, subsidizing loans, 
uh, and ensuring that it's illegal, uh, putting in place laws that prevent banks from uh, discriminating against people based on race or based on neighborhood. And so a lot of that infrastructure is in place and, and has been in place for a while. Uh, and uh, still that, <laughs> that gap uh, between the percentage of families, uh, percentage of say white families that own homes and percentage of black families that own homes remains. Uh, so, so just to kind of chip away at the problem. So when, when banks are evaluating uh, loan applicants, they look at things like credit scores, uh, loan to value ratios, debt, uh, debt to income ratios, your asset liquidity, uh, your documentation, that is you documenting, you know, your income and, and your assets. Uh, and I don't think there's any appetite, uh, certainly not among banks, about relaxing those, relaxing those requirements uh, further just because of what happened during the, the 2008 uh, crisis. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think what, what uh, lenders can do and maybe what, what regulators or, or um, lawmakers can do is ensure that uh, there's more transparency about how those decisions get made. And so, uh, uh, but uh, they may not know the role that that played in getting their loan application denied. So, so that's one kind of approach that we can make. I mean, we live in the age of data and, uh, and wide access to data, ubiquitous access to data. And so I think it could be a you know, partial solution could be ensuring that folks have access to the right kind of data. Um, and then that could help uh, applicants learn how to improve their applications uh, you know, for the next go around. Um, and uh, when it comes to interest rate, for example, so banks, uh, you know, I personally think that there's a ton of information out there on interest rates. And so uh, I, I, I was puzzled uh, as to why uh, families would settle for an interest rate, and, uh, you know, an extremely high interest rate uh, without shopping around, because if you just go online, there's a ton of information there and you can sort of pick your lender, you can shop around. So this could come down to uh, a matter of financial literacy um, for, for families that are, you know, buying, house, buying houses, you know, it, you know, some families are just more financially literate than others. And so that would suggest that perhaps one of the things that we can do is just embed that. And I thought this for a, a long time, just embed financial literacy into the education system. Uh, starting in, in K through 12, uh, but of course, in, you know, in college as well, we have requirements for you know, history and, and English and math and science. Uh, and yet, uh, some of the things that uh, really affect, you know, something that's critical to us, which is building wealth, we don't require. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, it's, it's offered, uh, but, it, but it's not required. So uh, we can go down that route. Um, I know that there are... Um, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of differences in how uh, black families and white families, uh, basically the channels that they use to get a loan. Uh, I understand that white families tend to go through traditional banks, black families and perhaps other minority families are more likely to go through non-traditional channels. And perhaps that's, that's part of the reason why they get uh, uh, higher interest rates. Uh, but at any rate, uh, those are just a few uh, of the things that I've, I think we could do at the margins to, uh, to improve home ownership and therefore wealth. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, stepping back again, uh, the magnitude of the wealth gap that we're trying to close, I think cannot ultimately be closed with the measures that we've been using. Uh, and I think therefore that any discussion about, uh, you, know, you know, racism, addressing it, uh, it has to include uh, reparations in that discussion uh, because all of the things that we're talking about, justice, uh, education, jobs, and so forth. Uh, these problems accumulated uh, over several hundred years, and uh, they they accumulated by virtue of laws and policies and cultural practices and you know uh, information communication uh, channels and media uh, that uh, you know that you know deprived uh, black folks of the opportunities to accumulate wealth, and much of that infrastructure is still in place. And when I read, you know, people who really research this, I don't research this for a living, uh, but people who really study this, they, they, they think that, um, you know, the problem is just too massive. And I think even if we address the problem just on a racial basis, even if we close the racial gap, say for the middle class, that still leaves to be solved the gap between uh, just the, you know, to say the top 1% and everyone else. So uh, I, would, I would liken it to, uh, 
remember uh, Bill Maher used to do a thing, uh, you know, where he'd bring out a plate of uh, steak and potatoes and, uh, you know, maybe there were some carrots on the plate and there would be some parsley. And, uh, you know, this was, in, you know, in debates about how to address the budget. Uh, well, and, and the budget deficit as well. And so, you know, people are focusing on, uh, you know, these tiny things like the parsley instead of focusing on the steak and the potatoes, which, you know, in the budget are things like, you know, defense spending and, you know, Medicare and Social Security. And so if, you, if you're going to address the problem, you've got to focus on the big ticket items instead of the tiny little items. And I, I get the sense that, you know, when we have these discussions, what I think are, use, are useful and, and necessary and all of the things that we're talking about doing, we need to do. Uh, uh, I definitely never want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, but I think we, we always need to have these conversations in the context of hey, what are the larger goals that we're trying to accomplish and, you know, what really needs to be done to get where we need to be to close even the income gap, uh, and that wouldn't get us to where we go. But then the wealth gap, I think, is a really big one. And that would allow us to really begin to address the political gap. Okay, I think those, those are uh, great things that you've said. And I, I want to expand this question also. But I also want to share a little bit of uh, additional context from my own experience. And it, it doesn't surprise me that, that the, you find ownership uh, a lot smaller in the African-American community. I grew up in a, a very low income African-American community. And I think when we have the kind of systemic racism uh, things happening that we've talked about in this panel in terms of the police coming through and, and taking people in and arresting them, uh, creating a, an environment that feels unsafe uh, to be an owner when the property values in the, whole, in the, in the neighborhoods where these African-American live uh, do not have the kind of appre appreciation that the investment opportunity is, is, is great as well. So I think it's not just a, a financial literacy issue, I think it's also a reality issue. And so I'd like to have Rachel uh, kind of maybe speak a little bit more to some of the other um, factors that might impact your ability to invest, your, some of the factors that might impact your social network or, or the way that you interact with the overall uh, justice system that might impact your ability to have uh, to, to basically grow your uh, assets enough to uh, be able to apply for an official loan from a bank. Yeah, so I think, you know, when we when we look at and I promise, you know, I as I was listening to everyone talk, I just have to say for a minute that as black people, we are the most resilient, wonderful people in the world with all the oppression. We were not slaves, we were enslaved. We were vibrant, brilliant people that were captured and brought here and with everything um, falling out of our favor, right? We don't have the winds at our back um, pushing us into opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, um, but we are still resilient and brilliant and looking at this panel of people of color that are exceptional, I'm just really proud even though, you know, it's, it's like, is, is there a single sector that we can win in, right? Like, is there a place where we are not oppressed or um, the centuries of, of um, you know, policies and, and rooted in slavery and racism that aren't set up for us to fail? But, you know, for me, as the, as the criminal um, legal expert on this panel, when people touch the criminal justice system, Roger, um, it's, it's very different for different communities, right? So depending, and wealth is the biggest indicator of whether or not you will have a positive interaction or not. So even people that are wealthy and black have a better um, interaction with the system than people that are poor and white, right? Because if you have access to good lawyers um, or understand the system, you get the benefit of that. So I think there are many, many ways though that the brand of a criminal um, record has precluded people from doing many of the things that allow them um, the access to thrive, right? And, and however we define that, whether that's being wealthy or whether that's owning a house. But when you think about all the things that your criminal record impacts, it's not just that you might have had to spend a night in jail or you might have had to serve a sentence. If it's really true that you're innocent until proven guilty, when we look at uh, Mahenor's statements in the beginning about all of the disparities regarding who's arrested, um, who's you know, uh, held without bail, who's given um, more significant charges than other people, um, those are all choices that are made in a process. And when we get out and have a criminal record, 
when you apply for your, to live in your first apartment, right? Or forget about that. Let's say you apply for a student loan. There are certain crimes that are nonviolent crimes that preclude you from getting any funding from the federal government. You can't get a student loan. And it, you know, if you're wealthy and your parents have enough money to pay for you to go to Stanford, right? Or even a state school, then that might not impact you. But when you get your first apartment, many of the many of the landlords run your criminal history, right? And they run your credit and other things like that. So I think that there are many barriers that my system starts with um, where we have to figure out and I, I, I really want to make this clear. I don't want to pull white society down to where poor people or rich people down to where poor people enter into the system. I want to pull poor people up to where rich people enter into the system. You know, I, I think there's a, a lot of people are talking um, or earlier today I was in a panel where somebody said, you know, there's a lot of people that feel or you, you Stacey, I think said reverse racism. Well, when you're entitled and privileged, um, equality or equity feels like oppression, right? Because you think something's being taken away from you. There's enough pie, right? We can all have a piece, but just stop hogging it all. So I think we have to, I only feel comfortable speaking about my lane, right? But I think, you know, it also includes education because um, juveniles are touching the system. School to prison pipeline is very, very real. Um, when we look at those numbers, um, they are exorbitantly high when it comes to black and brown people, not just boys. Girls are faring very poorly as well. They are expelled at higher rates. Uh, the police are called at higher rates. Their schools are the ones that have the metal detectors and the school resource officers in them. So I think there's a lot of ways that my system touches people and you never come out, you rarely come out better. Um, you know, and, and so that, that is, that is how I think we can be better is thinking that we should only be branding people for the most violent and serious crimes with the criminal record because it plays, unless you, even if you get it sealed, guys, it still says Rachel Rollins, one record sealed. They don't know if that was like jaywalking or quadruple homicide, right? Like I'd actually prefer just to see what your record was because our imagination might be so terrifying that we don't end up giving you a job in the first place. And unless it's expunged, um, you know, we get to see people's records all the time. Thank you, Rachel. Um... Okay, so um, uh, we, would move, we would move on to that last question. I would like all the panelists to address the last question. Uh, so by 2042, the majority of people in this country will be people of color. And uh, like uh, John was uh, referring earlier that we need to close the wealth gap. According to McKinsey report, by closing the racial wealth gap, the US US GDP could be projected four to six percent higher by uh, 2028. No action will cost the US economy one to 1.5 trillion between 2019 and 2028. It is high time we reduce systemic racism on a targeted timeline. So the question is, um, taking what you have observed in your industry and what you have heard today about uh, different industries and the public domain such as the criminal justice system, can you please share with us how we might collaborate to change the world? So we'll do a round table. Um, uh, first, let's go ahead, uh, Angela, could you please uh, add to it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as we've been talking about today, there's so many different interwoven systems at play here. You know, as Rachel very articulately spoke to, you know, the fact that we're seeing overrepresentation in prisons is because of this whole trickle down system from lack of representation in prosecutors by virtue of prosecutorial discretion, judges, um, sentencing discretion, and then ultimately politicians, right? Because that's kind of where the, um, the constituents have a voice. So, um, so that, you know, that's one system, the one that I'm very familiar with, um, you know, we're seeing lack of, um, you know, representation in entrepreneurs. And that's due to lack of access to funding, you know, as John spoke to, uh, the banks um, have played a big role in that. And, and also investors, venture capitalists, and other sources of investors, there's very little um, 
representation in those funding sources, which trickles down to um, entrepreneurs uh, lacking opportunity. And then, as we've also spoken to, the employees at companies, especially, you know, tech is very, um, is one that's very visible, um, which, you know, is a trickle down from lack of representation in leadership and lack of representation in, in company boards, which also comes from the investor community. So, you know, I think this idea of setting societal targets on a timeline is actually like a, a pretty compelling one, especially given just, um, you know, how big of a role right now the momentum is that is enabling like both customers, um, you know, at, and really like the public from a media perspective to play a meaningful role in holding these people accountable. Like, for example, um, you know, even just, you know, the the national attention for certain cases, or if there's a Netflix documentary, like really bringing awareness to a certain, um, you know, injustice that's happening, we're seeing meaningful, like, change happening due to those things. And, you know, I think that setting societal targets on a timeline could be a, a way for everyone to participate in that accountability. Um, but the one thing that I feel really strongly about is that we just have to, we, we, we have to concurrently fix multiple broken parts of society. Um, I don't think we can only work on one injustice at a time. You know, it's not a zero sum, um, some game. So these domains of systemic racism are interdependent. And, you know, I think this idea is, is really powerful because we do have to rebuild the whole system on a timeline. Thank you, Angela. Um, and next, uh, St Stacy. Yeah. Um, this is this is what I recommend. Uh, no matter you know what role you play, if it's in your in your college or if it's um, at your job, identify what your network is. If that is your uh, coworkers, if that is um, some type of volunteer organization, and talk to the leaders um, and ask the question: What are we doing? What are we doing to be um, to to fight racial discrimination? What are we doing to hire? What are we doing to have executives of color? What are we doing to bring on more suppliers? Ask those questions, and guaranteed you'll probably get a lip service answer. That's fine to start with. The next question is: How can we make it better? Continuous improvement that has to happen. Like Angela said, this we can't go one by one. And then the, the third thing to say is, what can I do to be a part of it? And that, and, and that is where we really began to build those grassroots initiatives within all of these different equals, ecosystems. And you may feel like, oh, I'm entry level, I'm not a leader, I can't do anything. Yes, everyone can play a part. There are action items or action steps that can be taken. And if you commit to saying, I want to act, I don't want to just speak, I want to act. Um, you can work within your network to to begin to to expand and, and improve the situation. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, Kevin, next. I would say uh, first and foremost, I would say educate yourself. There are so many different great books and resources, TED Talks, etc. I know Ibram X Kendi just released a book called Anti Racist that I'm currently reading right now. There's so many things out there that can allow you to learn about the plight of black people as well as the history of this country and the history of white supremacy in order to kind of understand what we're dealing with and how to break these structures and these systems that already exist. But then I would say, um, I would challenge you to research and look at a, a theory called um, systems thinking uh, because I believe it's gonna take strategic partnerships to really um, work together in tandem to kind of A, figure out what a basic general agenda is and what success really looks like regarding reparations and, and taking down systemic racism. And so those kind of exist through coalition building. Uh, I'm always looking at the civil rights movement and I look at uh, the Montgomery bus boycott taking a whole year of people planning, strategizing, organizing, and boycotting a system that would make life for them so much easier to get to where they needed to go on the bus system, not using text messages, not using you know social media or TikTok to communicate. These are just grassroots people putting their heads together and, and organizing. So we need to get back to those things, building coalitions, using these partnerships, and really moving the needle further from not just a, a statement about your Black Lives Matter from a company and washing your hands of it, 
or getting that one token African-American person as a director of um, diversity or something to be able to have input on things, but really taking it a step further and looking at your board of directors, looking at the diversity on there, looking at the diversity of your senior leadership, and then really making strides to making your company as well as the world more diverse. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, John, next. Uh, thank you, sir. So, I think one of the um, one of the best things we can do is all get on the same page. Uh, you know, those of us who are you know who, who want to see you know greater equity. Um, and fortunately, we live in an age uh, of information. Uh, but I think uh, you know not everyone has time to you know read all the books or to go you know go to grad school, uh, do a you know even a bachelor's, let alone a, a master's or a PhD. Um, and so I, I think um, we might not be unified. So and I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, I would, uh, you know, in preparing for this uh, session, I would, I would review some materials where one person would say, well, what we really need to be doing is we really need to be, you know, black people need to support black businesses. And other people would say, well, no, black people, you know, that's not enough for black people to rise out of their situation. And so uh, I think historically, lots of things have been proposed and lots of things have been tried. Uh, and, you know, we may not all be on the same page as to what those things are. And so I think uh, we can extract lessons from history, from politics, from social science, uh, everything that's been written, uh, spoken, uh, put on video, and then critically assess all of that material uh, so that everyone can get on the same page about what the goals are, uh, what's been proposed to achieve those goals, what, you know, what's been tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and, uh, and what should we do now? Uh, and then, of course, measure progress towards those goals. And I think technologies like AI and natural language, and language processing can help us out. Uh, and I think education platforms can help us out. So once all this information you know, exists in the world, uh, it can be readily accessed by people. And it doesn't take them you know, two years or four years to get on top of it. Um, and the other thing I think there should be, a, a, I mean, there are platforms for gathering and aggregating opinions and ideas. But I think one of the platforms could be about this thing that we're talking about right now. Uh, and again, natural language processing can help in that uh, effort as well. Uh, and then, uh, you know, all of us have these incredible backgrounds uh, in business and, and law and so forth. And so uh, bring some of those, you know, analytical skills, advanced analytics, policy analysis, gaming, simulation, forecasting, scenario analysis. I mean, every single thing that we, that we have been, uh, you know, learning all of these years, bring it to bear on this issue uh, or these set of issues really. Uh, and again, here I think uh, AI and something that's on the horizon called quantum computing will be able to help us because some of these problems are too com complex to be solved even by modern computers, but there's technologies on the horizon that uh, will probably be able to help us out. Uh, and then uh, I think in terms of, you know, for any particular thing that we propose, will it actually move the needle? Uh, will it help to narrow a particular gap? Uh, and how much time will it take to know that gap? And I think that's how this portion of the session was launched, put a timeline on this stuff. So if we executed a particular strategy, you know, at a particular level, you know, how many years will it take? And I've seen in some instances, you know, if we keep doing such and such, it'll take us, you know, 200 years to close the gap. So that's the kind of thinking that I think we need to bring to bear. Uh, and if a strategy won't work at its current level, can it be anticipated? Uh, how intense does it need to be to close the gap within say two years or five years or, or whatever that number is? Um, and so forth. And I think we need to be really careful about the people that uh, we have represent us. And this ties back to the political discussion. Uh, you know, the, bro the voting technology in this country is broken. It should be standardized across the country. Uh, you know, we should have receipts uh, so that people can actually go back and count votes. Uh, so you know, those are a few thoughts that I have about where to go next. Thank you, John. Rachel, please. Yeah, I, brilliant. I mean, everything everyone said, I'm proud as an elected official Right now in Massachusetts, we have every level. Um, we have a federal representative in Ayanna Presley, who's a congresswoman. Uh, we have district representative or county representative in that I'm the newly elected DA, first woman to ever have this position in the over 200 years. We've uh, been the Suffolk County DA's office, first woman of color in the history of Massachusetts. We have um, a minority majority Boston City Council and those are all great things to say, but we are uniform and talking with each other. We, do, we are not a monolith. We do not all agree on everything, but we respect each other enough to have the discussions about legislation up at the state statehouse. Um, we don't have nearly enough representation there, but the Black and Latino Caucus, 
is always speaking with uh, uh, U.S. Congresswoman Ayanna Pressley and myself. Um, certainly in this uh, climate with respect to all of the changes proposed regarding criminal legal um, issues. I want to encourage people to get uncomfortable. Change never happens when we are like blissfully happy, you know, and without a care in the world. We are usually just strolling on through our lives. If, if we are honest with each other, and you don't need to share, but like go back in your mind to when you grew the most as an individual. It was usually in a profoundly, um, you know, hurt or uh, scared or frightened phase in your life that you came out and were able to, I hope, thrive. And that's where we find ourselves. Um, you know, for me, no, I'm not uncomfortable, but this was not the type of panel I was I usually am on. I was on a national panel last night with the NAACP about where we find ourselves with criminal legal reform. That is where I am. But I think it's important that I learn from you guys and hopefully you've learned a few things from me. And even if you haven't, you now know a district attorney. So if you have questions about what you're reading about or what your people are proposing and you're part of the United States, call me and I'll be able to for send you a couple quick um, articles. Um, we need to speak to each other, we need to respect each other, and we need to learn from each other. And I know that's hard. It's one thing I do want to make sure you guys know. I was really proud that I wrote a letter to all my law enforcement partners. Um, as the chief law enforcement officer of Suffolk County, I have the Mass State Police, Boston Police, Chelsea Winthrop Revere, and Transit Police. I have six different police departments. And I said, I'm the only woman, and I said, you are ordered to come and have, we're going to break bread together and have a confidence discussion about race policing and the black community uh, because I've made a lot of comments and didn't mince my words about how I felt watching a lynching m multiple lynchings actually over the last several months um, and you know that those are the ones that died we haven't even talked about the microaggressions with respect to Omar Jimenez the jur journalist at CNN or Christian Cooper right um, and the sort of weaponizing of race uh, by people who know that by calling the police, and these are well-intentioned um, Democrats that are doing this. These aren't sort of the hillbillies that we like to think of with respect to Ahmad Arbery. These are northerners, right? Or people in California, the woman with all the uh, plastic surgery who told the, um, the, the man of color, oh, in, in the nicest voice possible, sir, unless you live here, you can't stencil that, right? What about him made you think he couldn't live there? So. I've called my police officers into meetings. We are having hard discussions. We are not gonna all walk out of here singing Kumbaya, but they're gonna respect my opinion and I'm gonna hear and respect what it is they have to say because we have to work together. It's that type of constant um, growth. And you know it is exhausting, I am fully aware of that. But we need to make sure we're having conversations because we have a moment right now that we cannot lose. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. We are ready to wrap up now. On behalf of Havarin Tech Seattle, Roger and I thank you for your time today. Our panelists, DA Rollins, Angela, Kevin, Stacy, and John, thank you. It was a great discussion and an informative session. We have learned a lot. Uh, to the participants, thank you for joining us today. It is remarkable how significantly all of our lives have changed over the past months. We hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy during COVID-19. We are grateful for the connection and strength of the Harvard alumni community. Thanks to your generosity and support. Hope this webinar will bring in some thought-provoking discussion if you're interested in learning more, please join us at Harvard in Tech Seattle. Thank you and goodbye for now. Bye.